Um, next, I'd like to introduce our first speaker of the day, Dr. David Strauss. And uh, David is the director of the Division of Applied Regulatory Science within um, CEDAR and has been in that office for, for several years. He has over 20 years of, of research experience and is going to speak to us today um, around his perspective on translating new drug development tools into regulatory use. David. The green. It's okay. All right, well, thank you, Nick, and thank you to the uh, Critical Path Institute for helping us uh, pull all of you together here and uh, really looking forward to having a robust set of talks and uh, panel discussions and then the breakout sessions tomorrow. So starting with why, why do we need to move new science into the drug development process? Uh, this is a question that all of you should ask yourself, I think, and may have uh, different answers to that question. I have some thoughts about this, and I'll get to that a little bit more as uh, my talk goes forward. Uh, the next part that I'm really going to focus on most in this talk is the how and my perspective on how do we translate new drug development tools into regulatory use. And I'm going to draw on some prior experiences that are not in the drug induced liver injury space, but in other areas. And then finally getting to what and what specific regulatory questions can new drug development tools help address today. And uh, Nick put up a slide with uh, phases of drug development. We want to what we're interested in here and from the FDA's perspective is how we can focus on questions from the sort of regulated part of drug development. And I think there are some specific questions in context of use that are addressable today. So one of my, um, I'm going to draw on sort of two broader experiences. And um, the first, uh, and I'm going to pull some information from a talk that we gave to the FDA Science Board uh, a little over a year ago in June 2022. It was on the topic of advancing alternative methods for regulatory use. And we have a cross agency uh, group that is working on this topic and thinking about not just in uh, the drug development space, but across FDA, how we can advance alternative methods. And if we focus on the why here, um, there's a lot of promising new technologies. Uh, there's been advances in systems biology, stem cells, engineered tissues, mathematical modeling, and these present new opportunities to improve our ability to predict risk and efficacy. This includes microphysiological systems combined in vitro and in silico models, and that is an approach we have taken in the cardiac safety space. Also, cellular models that can be genetically engineered cellular models. We've actually had applications in drug development where we've used cellular models to assess efficacy or effectiveness in rare diseases where we couldn't enroll or the sponsor couldn't enroll and we couldn't assess the effectiveness in certain variants and we extended the indications of certain drugs based on cellular data. So these advances may bring products to market faster with improved efficacy or prevent products with increased toxicological risk from reaching the market. But uh, how do we do that? And it's actually quite difficult and multiple steps are required to translate these new technologies into regulatory use and maintain the same standards of safety, efficacy, and quality of FDA regulated products. And I think the most important concept that I'm hoping more people think about at this workshop is the context of use. And, and it's, it's, it's sort of very challenging. <laughs> it's still challenging for me. And I think you're going to hear more about that. You'll hear about it from Jeff Siegel in, in the next talk, I, I believe. And you know, we need to have predictable models, reproducible models, quality control, and they need to be for context of use that are going to be useful in drug development and evaluation. And we're nowhere near being able to replace all animal testing, but there are opportunities 
for alternative methods to make additional inroads in addressing the, th the three R's here is re referring to the replacing, reducing, and refining um, animal testing for specific contexts of use. And this was a, a slide that had been in that uh, FDA science board presentation. So then coming back to the, the what. And um, so uh, this image, there was a, a former member of our division that I had asked once, could he show, so, show an image of drug development? And, and he was a really good artist and this is what he came up with. And so, um, you know, the drug discovery and early development was sort of the, the top part of here. And, and I think in leading up to this workshop, there's various from the model developer side or from the pharmaceutical industry side. I mean, th this is a very important context of use, but it's not the context of use that we are most um, it's sort of in our wheelhouse at FDA. And we're really interested in the, the part after or at the time of an IND, an investigational new drug application, but then phase one and two clinical development, phase three clinical development, the time of a marketing application, and you finally get a approved drug. And so when we say translating new drugs, development tools into regulatory use, we're thinking about what are the questions we can help answer or address in those phases? So I, I was in my sort of scientific expertise and training for many years was in the cardiac space, cardiac safety. And we, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this cardiac safety initiative we had that really started 10 years ago. And then about five years ago, though, we opened the ICH guidelines, uh, ICH E14 and S7B, which are the E14 was the, is the clinical uh, regulatory guideline for assessing proarrhythmic risk, and S7B is the non-clinical guideline. And they, they really were sort of completely separate documents. And you did the S7B studies, submitted the IND, if you're a drug company, FDA looks at it, and then, we just like completely forget it and and clinical development goes on and you follow e14 and there was like some suggestion in the guidelines oh we should they should like talk to each other and th but it, it didn't happen and and so in when we open um well in the ich group which if you're not familiar is all the major global drug regulators around the world and then representatives from industry pharma in the us equivalent in Europe and Japan and get together and see if you can harmonize regulatory guidelines. And in this case, we were we developed a combined set of qu questions and answers, which is then a new regulatory guideline in itself of how to really integrate them together. And in this case, the uh, these are some slides that had been part of a, a webinar we did when we were actually when the, the draft set of questions and answers had come out and they were later finalized a year and a half ago. But the, the, the value proposition was they're directed at scenarios where non-clinical data in, can reduce the number of clinical studies. And so if you're familiar with clinical drug development, there's this so-called thorough QT study, TQT, and it's not very efficient and it's not that specific. And so can we reduce them? Um, streamline drug development, inform clinical decision making at different stages during clinical development and also at the time of a marketing application and how can you leverage the non-clinical data and the clinical data for example to better inform labeling um, to better communicate risk i mean we have this like crazy language that gets into drug labels and it's like no large qt effects and it's like what the heck does that mean and I, I don't know what that means but it, like can we do something better and like communicate actually this drug has low risk this one or we don't need to say anything we don't and so how can we have this better integrated risk assessment and so how, how did we get there in that cardiac safety initiative i mean it was a large effort with many people at fda in the pharmaceutical industry, in the uh, sort of CRO, contract research organization space, tool developers, there was applied research and collaboration, workshops, kind of like this one, developing white papers, and ultimately developing guidance 
policy training, and that's and that's continuing. Uh, we actually still have an ICH E14 S7B discussion group. We had one of our calls earlier this week. I think it was Tuesday morning, and we're still figuring out how to implement and what the next steps are. But uh, you may think, oh, great, we have a workshop. And we'll just figure it out today, and everything will will go forward. But there were actually a lot of workshops. I mean, there were five workshops in in, in this initiative, and there was. Um, uh, studies going on in parallel. And then in 2018, that's when we opened the ICH guidelines uh, to make the revisions that we did. But I think we can learn from this experience. And I'm not saying that this drug induced, if, if we do something here in the drug induced liver injury space, it's going to follow this model exactly. But I think there's some lessons that can be learned. And um, I think one of the lessons is, is like bringing all the stakeholders together and because it's not it's not like oh it's what somebody at fda wants to do it's everything's got to align to actually move some new process forward in in my opinion and what were some of uh there was a lot of applied research that went on in that initiative and as this was not by any means the the only study and but this related to an international quote multi-site study of human induced pluripotent stem cell derived cardiomyocytes for drug proarrhythmic potential assessment and i mean this was a study that fda provided some funding to a, a consortia and but it really was a small amount of funding and a large group of people from multiple continents and 10 laboratories were mainly volunteering their time to participate in this large um, consensus protocol driven study with different cell lines, different devices. And so it's, you know, it's a something that happened there um, out of some out of some of the one of the final workshops, there were breakout sessions and there were white papers that then were written over the following year uh, on on the left, human uh, or white paper on human stem cell derived cardiomyocyte assays. On the right, on proarrhythmia model validation that was actually initially focused on the in silico models, computational models, but the principles were broad enough that they can apply to in vitro models as well. And I mean, you probably get the picture from the little infographics. You know, we had a lot of people contributing, and these these went on to then um, form the basis of, of some of what ended up in the, the ICH E14 S7B questions and answers. There's, there's uh, parts that are specifically to the clinical guideline E14, and then to the, to the non-clinical guideline S7B. And it starts out like the questions and answers to the non-clinical guideline is, is, you know, the first question and answer is all about the integrated risk assessment. Um, but then other parts of the questions and answers, there's best practice recommendations for in vitro ion channel and human induced pluripotent stem cell assays. And a later, the last set of questions and answers to the non-clinical guideline is about principles for validating in vitro and in silico proarrhythmia models and qualifying them for regulatory use. And I think there's a lot of parallels um, that could expand, for example, to the liver space. So I just point these out. Uh, if people are interested in in the future. And we talked about that some in, uh, there was an article uh, that uh, the FDA colleagues that were part of our ICH, um, oh, whatever we, uh, group that representing the FDA for the E14 S7B working group. And there was a um, additional article, these appeared in the same, same issue in clinical pharmacology and therapeutics. It was highlighted on the cover. That was an industry perspective. And um, yeah, I mean, it mainly focused on the, the cardiac safety space, but you know, talked about how this integrated non-clinical clinical assessment could serve as a model for other safety areas in drug development and regulatory evaluation. And so to wrap this up, uh, why have this workshop? Well, as has been alluded to in the two talks already today, including mine, I think it's important to bring all the stakeholders together. So, you know, the group can figure out the 
why, how, and what. So thanks for joining.